So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really glad to see so many people here, and uh, we have a special treat today. I get to introduce Dr. and Professor Clara Landau, who's uh, a professor and chair at the University of Zurich. I was fortunate enough to uh, get to be in her department for six months, um, teaching residents and working uh, in neuro-ophthalmology. And uh, uh, Professor Landau uh, actually grew up in Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, uh, moved to Switzerland uh, and went to um, undergraduate school and graduate school and medical school at the University of Zurich. Uh, then she did internship and residency um, partly at Zurich, but uh, partly also in Israel. Um, and then uh, came back to the University of Zurich. And in 2002, she became the first woman chair of a clinical department um, and has been the chair of ophthalmology since that time and has built a fantastic department of wonderful, gifted uh, clinicians. Uh, she's been the president of the Swiss National, or Swiss Ophthalmology uh, Society. She's the president-elect of the European Neuro-Ophthalmology Society. She is also the vice chair of the Gender e Equality Office, or Gender Initiative uh, with the Gender Equality Office, and um, that was the program that I was a part of. And so I can't tell you how excited I am to have her here. Um, we set up a, a lectureship in neuro-ophthalmology, and Clara is the first lecturer to um, present uh, for our uh, division. So, Clara, we're thrilled to have you here, and she's going to be giving us a lecture on uh, trochlear nerve palsy tricks and tips, the TTT lecture. So, um, Clara, I'm going to turn it over to you. <coughs> well, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, this is really a wonderful occasion for me to see where you come from, and I'm overwhelmed just these past 10 minutes. I have seen your, this, this building, and we are now thinking of how to increase our department, and there is no space, and I love this feeling of big, big space in, in you have here, and it's a wonderful, um, as I said, a wonderful experience for me. And that all is based on uh, what you just heard, that Kathleen was with us for half a year, and it was the most wonderful year and exciting year we had in our department with her, and you will see a few pictures of it. Now, Kathleen asked me that before I talk on the trochlear nerve palsy, people may be interested in a little bit of, uh, well, history or a few facts about um, our department in Zurich. So I've done a very short uh, presentation here, and you may be familiar with a few of these names. Well, first of all, this is Zurich, so we do have mountains as well up here, not quite as high, but and not every day can you see them from Zurich, but, but this is um, our town, and the University of Zurich is a little bit up the hill, so on nice days we, ca we have this view. Um, here is the Department of Ophthalmology, but not only ophthalmology, we, are, we have three floors here, but there is also the ENT department and maxillofacial surgery, but this is our, it's actually the newest building in this, um, in this university hospital. Um, <coughs> here is the first chair of um, Department of Ophthalmology. Um, you may know his name, um, Johann Friedrich Horner, and I find this kind of nice that a pupil expert came to our place um, where the most famous, um, well, let's say most famous uh, publication of uh, Friedrich Horner is, has to do with the pupil. Anyway, he, so he started, he was the first professor of ophthalmology. Before that, ophthalmology was part of general surgery. And it was actually Bill Roth, whom you may have heard about as well, a surgeon <coughs> in the 19th century, who realized that, you know, this eye surgery is just a little bit too special to have it within general surgery, so he was the strong man at the faculty and, and he th decided that Horner could be the first uh, professor of ophthalmology. So he, was, he did that for quite a number of years, over 20, 23 years, um, <coughs> and uh, built up the department. Now, the next one 
well, that, that's just the um, official letter of appointment of Friedrich Horner, which, as you know, Kathleen, is hanging in our department on the wall, and uh, he got 1,000 francs a year. So that was his salary. So things changed sin since then, luckily. Um, anyway, um, he was really um, a very famous, he became very famous, and people started to be interested in this specialty. So the next, uh, his, uh, his next was uh, Otto Harp, and you may be familiar with Harp's strie in congenital glaucoma, so he's the one who described <coughs> them. Besides that, he um, invented a huge magnet to take out um, metal, metallic foreign bodies out of the eyes, so this was bigger than a person, a huge, uh, huge magnet, so people, all patients were brought to Zurich to, to have their metallic foreign bodies being taken out of their eyes. Um, the next was uh, quite a short period of time, so he didn't really make a big impact. He passed away soon after he was appointed, Ernst Ziegler. But then the next one was Alfred Vogt, another name you may be familiar with, Vogt Kranagi Harada, for instance. That's the Vogt. It's not Vogt, it's Vogt. And um, <coughs> he... Um, he, book, he wrote a fantastic book um, of slit lamp, but uh, an atlas actually, of slit lamp biomicroscopy, which is really quite amazing. I mean, they did not have photography, they had wonderful, um, you know, at least as much merit goes to the person who illustrated this book uh, as to, to Professor Vogt. So I can't go into details here, but again, a, a famous name. Mark Amsler, who took over from Vogt, and may I just show you, you know, this was a tough guy. He wasn't very pleasant. Um, <laughs> we were s we <laughs> there is a story that the residents had to open the, you know, at, in ground floor, they had to open the, the elevator door for him, then he would go in and then ha they had to run up to third floor to be there in time to open the door again. <laughs> so that's a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's a good one. And Mark Amsler was just, just the total opposite. Very nice and still, you know, very productive. And of course, he invented the Amsler net, which until today is called after him for uh, exploring metamorphopsia or visual field defect in the central field. Okay, Rudolf Wittmer was the next. Um, he may not be that famous. Um, he was a fantastic, he was interested mostly in uveitis. Um, and he was a very, very good corneal surgeon, so people came from all over the world to have uh, his double suture corneal transplant um, done by him. Um, then came Balda Glor, who is still um, alive, so all the others passed away, but Balda Glor is now over 80, and he was a glaucoma specialist who also uh, did some of his training in, uh, in the U.S., um, and whom I knew very well, of course, because I worked with him. And for two years, um, his um, next, the next chair was Theo Zeiler, who is a corneal and refractive surgeon, um, and who, after two years, in a way, had to leave because it didn't work out very well, not for him and not for the department, definitely. So then um, I came, but this is our department today, you know, um, with some of the key people here, but of course I can't tell you more than that. And uh, uh, as I said, all these people greet you. They had so much good time with you. Kathleen was fantastic in teaching. She had just a little bit more time than we did. And she really took this upon her to, to teach the residents. She, did the, she distributed the journal club. So uh, we had a half a year of neuro-ophthalmology journals you know, really one after the other, and, and people are now really on top of it. And here she is teaching. <coughs> um, this is actually the neurology. She did that also in neurology. This is the neurology department with these very old-fashioned, um, uh, you know, but that reminded you of what, Boston, <laughs> is the dome? Okay, it's not, but it's a little smaller, probably. Okay, good, she did, she participated in some of the um, um, teaching activities, you know, bigger events, like, of course, with Michael Werner, her husband, 
on neurologic and ophthalmologic complications in pregnancy. That was a big um, event on, on April 24. We, had, we have some regular um, um, such events in the ophthalmology department, so she, she talked on <coughs> photophobia. And then we had a very fun course, um, which takes place every two years in a castle, actually, next to Zurich, on the Zurich Lake. And that's the neuro-ophthalmology course with some guests from, from abroad, and, and Kathleen was one of them. And this is just the wrong, that's the one for two years before, so, you know, I put in the wrong one. But anyway, <laughs> it, it looked very nicely and very similar next year. Okay, so, so far for a, a short introduction about our department and about the time we had together. And now, um, what about trochlear nerve palsy? Well, this lecture is, is simple. It's not anything complicated. Um, I just know that um, vertical strabismus is, is quite often a challenge when these patients come into your office. You're alone. You don't, may not have too many people to rely on at the moment, and you want to do the best out of it. So let's go and um, take a trip on this. So as you all know, the three-step test developed by, um, by Parks is a very neat uh, way to start. So now all you have to do is look at this scheme and kind of cover your left eye and look at it with your right eye, right eye in the center. And then you have to know your functional anatomy as far as this. You have to know that looking up and right is mostly the job of your superior rectus muscle. And here the inferior rectus muscle and the obliques are just the other way around. So that's easy, right? But that you have to know. And then you have to give it a thought. The first step is which eye is the higher one? So if you find a patient in whom on alternate cover testing you have a right over left, what is wrong with the right eye? Is it the elevators that are paretic, or is it the depressors? Well, of course, it's the depressors. Otherwise, that's why the high, the eye is higher than the other one, right? So you, all you have to do, it's the depressors, and you just make your line here, okay? Then you compare, is it worth on right gaze or on left gaze? Does this vertical deviation increase on right gaze or on left gaze. And in this case, it increased on left gaze. So all you have to do is put your mark, put your line on the left side. And the third step, as you know, is you know comparing the, the amplitude of this vertical deviation on right head tilt and left head tilt. And in this example, it was larger on <coughs> right head tilt. And now you have your scheme and you have one box in which all three lines interact, and that's, that's the answer. So the paretic muscle is the right superior oblique. And so far, so good. You can have a d another situation in which, you know, it's uh, this way round. So you have one box which is free. No line goes through it, and that's the left superior oblique, okay? So now we are set for doing this um, unless <coughs> if you have a, a result which doesn't make much sense. Well, it does. It could be that the left <coughs> inferior oblique is paretic. That's what your three-step test tells you. But <coughs> that's not a muscle which is innervated by only one cranial nerve. So it may be the case. It may not be the case. And then it's your general judgment, of course, you know, and all the other aspects. It could be even just restriction. It could be anything. So um, there is actually a nice um, article by Bert Kushner who, who cautions this and who says that there may be some errors in the three-step test in the diagnosis of vertical strabismus. And he starts this article by saying, the three-step test is wonderful for every and each patient who comes into your office and says, doctor, could you please tell me which one of my eight cyclovertical muscles is paretic? All these patients, you can 
street with this, and you get your answer. Okay. So um, let's go into some. Uh, yeah, and you have seen that some. This is actually very old, and it's from my time when I was a resident, and I just have it in my pocket, and I kind of can do it quickly, um, and that's what I wanted to to uh, show you. There are other ways to do it, I know. But again, let's go to the anatomy. So what are some special features of the trochlear nerve? As you all know, it's very long and very thin. As we said, it only has to supply one small, but important, uh, muscle, extraocular muscle. Um, it's also the only cranial nerve that exits dorsally from the, from the brain stem. All the others come out on the, on the ventral side. And it's also uh, the only one that crosses, um, and that it does so at the level of the, in the midbrain, at the level of the inferior colliculi. Um, both these sh very short fascicles, as I said, they cross at the bottom of the fourth ventricle, uh, and thus they actually, the, the, um, uh, the cairn, um, the nucleus of the fourth nerve on the right side finally supplies the left superior oblique and vice versa. And this is all taken from, you probably also teach with, or do, do you use the Bachandas, Klein and Bachandas book for teaching the residents? Yes. Uh, this is of course very schematic, but it's, it's nicely put so you see where the, the nucleus is and how uh, this long nerve has to cross dorsally uh, to the other side, go around the whole brainstem, and then here bet between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery goes in between here to the clivus here and into the cavernous sinus, and then finally through the superior orbital fissure into the orbit. Um, so that's just another view um, to see how the nerve is. Of course, here you will rarely have an isolated fourth nerve palsy uh, within the cavernous sinus. It could be the case, but it would be unusual. Um, one more picture here of the potential lesion sites. It can be, of course, within the brainstem. It's much more rare, but it does exist. And um, uh, trauma actually happens probably here mostly, and uh, then cavernous sinus and the orbit. So what are some special functional features of the trochlear nerve? Well, this is really a puzzling um, entity, the congenital palsy, people who, and we will talk more about that, um, who actually, with in whom is it the nerve or is it the muscle? That's a huge uh, discussion, and it's probably both, but, um, and it's very heterogeneous, but um, another special feature is that being this such a thin and vulnerable nerve, even a minor trauma can cause a palsy. Uh, then there is this entity of superior oblique myokinia, um, which I'm not going into, but you know, these patients who have been to so many ophthalmologists uh, before, and everybody thinks they are crazy, but actually they are not. And if you look at them, and if you can um, provoke the, the um, symptom, then you see that this eye, with your slit lamp examination, has a very, very quick rotatory nystagmus in this one eye, and people really say that there is something wrong with my eye, and, and many times they don't get diagnosed, especially if it's intermittent, of course, um, and it's benign. And then trochlear nerve schwannomas, well, that's a rare entity, but it's so rare, actually, that um, a big, big group of neuro-ophthalmologists had to pulled together a few cases that was published a couple of years ago. Okay, and it's of course benign, but you know, not really treatable other than by uh, performing some extraocular muscle surgery. Okay, uh, so let's go to congenital trochlear nerve palsy. You know, uh, when I, I actually did my fellowship in, in San Francisco and, and you know, in, in Israel, my teacher was Moshe Oliver, who was a, a pupil of uh, Marshall Parks, so I came to Switzerland with the American view on many things, especially strabismus. And I was struck how different strabismus is being looked at in, in Europe. 
I don't know, some of you may know the name of Josef Lang, who, is, uh, who was a very <coughs> famous serologist in Europe, and he had a big fight with Parks. You know, so Parks talked about monofixation syndrome, and Lang talked about microstrabismus and whatever. It was the same entity, but they called it differently. Anyway, they were both great giants of strabismus, but uh, somehow Europe and, and um, America didn't get along too well. So there is another name to it in, in uh, German or Latin, strabismus surso adductorius, which means that the eye goes up on abduction, the eye goes up. Okay. So it's very, very frequent, and you know this, uh, this saying, fat scan instead of CAT scan, family album tomography is much cheaper than computer assisted tomography, no side effects. Um, it's a great uh, way to diagnose this. And so if you have somebody, you know, since first grade, always looking into the camera in, in group photos, that's the best, group photos. They always look like this, then they have, what, a right short term nerve palsy, right? Okay. So their vertical fusional ability is just amazing. I mean, they come to you with a little head tilt, and then you start your checking, and then the eyes go like, like this. They can fuse 30, even 40 prism diopters of vertical deviation. Now you try that. That's really tough. You can't do it. Um, so that's a very good sign of something very, very old, and thus not very dangerous. Uh, motility, <coughs> what I mean here is the overaction of the antagonist of the inferior oblique is so pronounced in these cases that, you know, when they look to the side of the palsy, when I have a right trochlear nerve palsy, I look to the left, my right eye goes up, and it's even, you know, the deviation is even larger when I go look left and up than when I look left and down. So the kind of the overaction of the inferior oblique is more pronounced than the underaction of the superior oblique. Um, here, just a few examples. <coughs> so this girl had a congenital nerve palsy, and this young chap had actually a acquired trochlear nerve palsy. Uh, anyway, the nine directions of gaze uh, in this acquired case are not very um, abnormal. I mean, this is the primary gaze, and you know, you don't see much. And this, this is what happens in acquired palsies. You check the motility, and it's actually normal, and the patient still bitter complains of double vision. There is some overaction here of the inferior oblique. Okay. Now, <coughs> the third step of the thir three step test is also called at least, again, in Switzerland, we don't speak that much of the three-step test. We, we have the Bielshovsky head tilt test, and Bielshovsky is another famous name you may know. <laughs> okay, so this girl, when, when being forced to have a left tilt, her left eye goes up a lot, so she avoids that, and this is a left congenital, in, in her case, congenital nerve, uh, fourth nerve palsy. This was a patient who really didn't want to get operated for a long time. <coughs> but then um, finally he, he agreed. So this was before the, the surgery and that's after surgery, just this left gaze and his right eye now stays nicely in place. And this was his, his nine directions of gaze before surgery with this huge overaction of the inferior oblique on the right side and now um, much better. So. You can do that. You can have the patients suffer a little longer and give them sometimes prisms, which may help for a while. You know, they can, when they drive, they just do this instead of looking to the side because otherwise they will definitely not find the right spot. But then, that's my opinion, it's nice to really have them at a stage when they want you to operate. Because of course, that's not only for strabismus, then they will be much happier when <coughs> things get better. Um, and so this is, I don't know how much you use this type of Hess screen. You don't? Okay. Well, Hess, Rudolf Hess was actually a Nobel Prize winner who was an ophthalmologist at some time. 
and then switched to physiology. Uh, it's a true story. When he had enough money, after having been an ophthalmologist for a few years, he went to do what he really loved to do, which is physiology, and he won the Nobel Prize. So um, this is the Hess screen test with the left eye here. You know, instead of being, well, you see that there is a right over left with an overaction of the inferior oblique. Then it became worse. That's the same patient. So now he decided, okay, let's do it. He was a lawyer, you know, so I wasn't too eager to operate on him either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this is the way it was before the operation and after the operation. Kind of a nice uh, improvement and he was quite happy. So, how do you treat it? Um, and this again is something I've seen, you know, there are books and of course they are wonderful and, but after a while for at least in strabismus surgery, you really develop your own ways based on mistakes, usually, try and error. <laughs> and um, so what I really could say after all these years, I almost never perform more than a weakening of the inferior oblique in these cases, not a second muscle at the same time. Why so? Um, you could do it in extreme cases, but in the literature it says, you know, from 15 or 20 diopters, prism diopters on, you should do two muscles. Don't, okay, if, if you take my advice, because these patients, even though they can fuse 30 or 40 prism diopters before the operation of, let's say, right over left, they can't do even two or three prism diopters left over right. That's just not what their brain is being trained for. So they will not be happy. Um, <coughs> and so what we do is um, an anteroposition of the inferior oblique, uh, which is corresponds to the 10 millimeter recess uh, described by Parks, and it's a quite an easy operation. So we just put together our cases of 45 patients uh, in the, you know, age. This is the age, um, and they have been operated between uh, 2000 and 2010, and. Um, we see all patients, of course, before surgery, and then we have them back three months after surgery and a year, which is very helpful to, you know, to make your own quality control and, and studies. So this would be uh, the result of this uh, group of patients. Um, it's always the status before surgery, then three months after and one year after, um, and that's, you know, the vertical deviation here, just the vertical deviation. So of course, hopefully it, it went down. Um, and in every position of gaze, we did this. Um, and it's interesting, actually, something I did not expect necessarily, that it even further improves, you know, between three months and one year, which is good. Because eventually, actually, these patients may come back um, after a few years more. We, we just had this one year follow up. Okay, so of course the vertical, that was what you saw was the vertical deviation before three months and after one year, that goes down. But also the horizontal, which is usually not very large, um, diminishes and the torsional as well. So um, this is in the Klinische Monatsblätter für Augenheilkunde. I'm sure that everybody reads this journal. <laughs> well, you're laughing now, but you know, um, this was actually founded by Albrecht von Graefe. This is a very old journal, um, and you can publish in English in there, and, and it's, um, it's co connected to the Swiss Ophthalmological Society, so that's why we have to publish there <laughs> a little bit. Um, okay, so these, this anteroposition of the inferior oblique muscle is a really interesting surgery because what we found out and what, what I kind of felt, but here it was evident in the study, the larger the deviation, the bigger the effect of surgery. Well, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I mean, where have you, you know, this, no other muscle will do this for you. You know, this is just fantastic. Whatever it takes, it will be done. You know, it's just fantastic. So I like the inferior oblique, as you see. Okay, um, any questions so far? Any comments? Well on time, okay. So let's go to the acquired trochlear nerve palsy and a few 
um, rules. Uh, this is again from Bachandas and Klein. Uh, this 10, 20, 30, 40 rule, 10% etiology is compression, so not much, but it's possible, of course. 20% ischemia, as you know, the microvascular ischemic nerve palsy is, can, can hit any cranial nerve. Uh, some, you know, they had to have some 30 here, so that's diverse or unknown. And lots of trauma, and that's actually the message. So many, many have uh, a trauma uh, background. Uh, and that's, of course, usually easy to find out. Um, so, of course, as always, what you have to do is make a very good neurological exam and find out whether this is truly isolated or not. And if it's not, then, of course, the other signs will lead you to make the correct diagnosis. Um, and as I said before, motility can really appear to be almost normal. Uh, so the, the usual scenario is of a patient, um, you know, having had a concussion um, and then waking up uh, in the emergency room with the surgeons and then complaining of double vision. And they, after all, they do the motility exam, but it's normal. So they say, oh, come on, you know, that's nothing. And at some point they, they get to us and, and usually they come like this, right? Because they usually have a bilateral trochlear nerve palsy and you, you need your superior obliques least when you look up. So they come like this and everything like this and everything is crossed and it's just terrible. But on motility exam, it looks normal. And even on cover testing, it may look quite normal because the main problem is the torsion and that you of course can't find out with cover testing. So this would be an example. This uh, was put together you know, measuring the, using the Harms tangent screen. Kathleen, you have seen it. It's, it's huge. It's, you know, a huge thing uh, on our wall in the strabismus department. And people have a head set on their, on their head and it's being done by an orthoptist. Do you have orthoptists here? I hope so. We have a school of orthoptics and that's really fantastic. That's such a big help. So they do these um, exams usually. And it's, um, of course, you have to uh, dissociate between the two eyes and the patient has to show where both uh, eyes have, um, you know, where the, pic the image of each eye is located. And the, there is also a line where they can adjust the torsion. So it's not just the point which you have in the HES screen test, but in this Harms tangent screen, you can also get a subjective measurement of all three directions, vor vertical, horizontal, and torsional deviation. So this, as you see, the largest vertical deviation is on down gaze and the largest x torsion is on down gaze. And you can also do the same in an objective manner. So you put a um, surge coil on the patient's eye and we have that set up as well. This is a magnetic field in which the patient again looks in all nine positions of gaze and you get from the same patient um, similar, well not similar, actually <laughs> some, somewhat different, more pronounced deviations. That's probably because the patient was already fusing some of it, but here it's, there is no fusion involved here. Um, it also gives you the excyclotorsion, but not in the absolute value, it's just uh, relative to the primary. The primary is defined as zero, and then there is a different, there is, there is an in cyclotorsion in up gaze and an ex cyclotorsion in down gaze. So this is a nice way, but it's not very practical. It's very cumbersome. And so, um, and you can put it in a nicer picture. And we actually compared this, um, this is quite a couple of years ago, 2006, we did this study to compare the subjective and the objective way of um, <coughs> measuring all three deviations in a trochlear nerve palsy. Uh, and now, you know, we are now, of course, the next step is video oculography. That's the best. And we are working on some special goggles with Connie Weber, you know, uh, that there is a pro pro research project going on to make it a little bit easier than this huge magnetic field and surge coil. 
um, which for instance you can't do in children, and it's quite cumbersome. Anyway, so again, so what do you do with when you have a patient with a fourth nerve palsy, which is acquired usually post-traumatic? Well, first of all, be sure that it's not bilateral. It may be asymmetrical, uh, but you know, then you operate on one eye and the other palsy kind of comes out of, of the bush, and then you have another, you, you would, I would still probably do the one side first, uh, but tell the patient before that there may be um, a bilateral problem. If you see from the very beginning that there is a bilateral palsy, then of course you treat both in the same procedure um, in your same surgery. So how do you look for that, for these sides of possibly bilateral palsy? Well, the x cyclotorsion will be really huge because that adds up, you know, each superior oblique muscle is palsied. That means that all of your in cyclotorsional capacity is gone. And that means that your x cyclotorsion will be very large. <coughs> On the contrary, your vertical deviation may be zero because if the the amount of the palsy is the same in in the right on the right side and on the left side that kind of neutralizes itself so you can really have a pa patient with uh, no vertical deviation at all or very very small okay and you will have a very pronounced v pattern because your superior obliques as you know obliques the b in the obliques tells you that the inferior obliques and the superior obliques have a little bit of an abduction uh, effect. Okay, so there will be a pronounced V pattern because of that, because you, you need your ob obliques more than superior obliques when you look down, <coughs> so that gives you an isotropia shift downwards. And of course, if you have even that, if you have a switch on right over left here and left over right here, then things are very clear. Good. <coughs> so now, in these cases, it's not the, uh, not primarily the inferior oblique, the antagonist, it's the palsied muscle which you have to strengthen, and you do, do that usually with a tuck, um, <coughs> and then you may do it with or without the inferior oblique as well. And there are tables for that, and patients are usually very happy. So here I am, uh, my general remarks would be that all roads lead to Rome, as you know, and this is really something quite special about strabismus, I think. You know, you, you develop your own methods, and that's the ones with which you actually have a success. So um, why not? <laughs> and um, the future dream would be to have a model, and I think many people are working on this, many groups, where you just put in your preoperative measurements, and it comes up with a precise operative plan, and it works. <laughs> That's the other um, thing that should be, should be um, uh, you know, nice to have. But on the other hand, you know, then we strobologists will not be needed anymore, so <laughs> maybe it's not that good. Okay. So um, I think I'm at the end of my talk. <laughs> this is um, a very nice uh, detail of, uh, of a picture which is in the um, art gallery in Zurich. It's by Amadeo Modigliani. It's uh, actually his almost wife. He almost married her, but then uh, he got tuberculosis and he died. Um, and she actually um, was pregnant, eight months pregnant, and jumped out of the window a day after he died. So, you know, a very tragic story. I don't know whether she did have a Pose nerve palsy or not, <laughs> but it's a beautiful picture, and it's just to tell you that there is lots to see in Zurich, and please come and visit. Thank you for having me. Well, if there is a clear um, history of trauma, um, that would be enough. You know, if you can document this fourth nerve palsy with your whatever you use, the tangent screen, the HES screen, 
then you have a set of data, and then you wait. Um, I usually we usually wait an, a year before operating because really it's amazing how well they can actually improve um, within a year. It's usually more in the first half year than in the second half year. But if you think whether to do more exams, like an MRI or anything, if it's very clear, I, I probably wouldn't. But you know, then again, the medical legal system is different here, but there is lots of discussion of incidental illness. You know, do you want to do an MRI and find something you don't want to know about, which is not related to what, what you're looking for? and these things. So I think if the situation was quite clear and if the, the double vision was there from the beginning, if it's half a year after the trauma but it's newly uh, symptomatic, then of course it may not be related at all. No. Is, is that <coughs> good to say? <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, um, Um, that and thyroid, it's always thyroid, you know, <laughs> not always, but that's really so common. Um, and then, then lots, th then, then much less, you know, anything else is really, that, that's it too, yeah, yeah. And they somehow always get, usually, you know, it's, it's sometimes tough for the patient to find the person who gives them the clear answer. And I've just seen a patient who came all the way from Slovenia and who had lots of MRIs and there was and still vertical diplopia. And you know, <coughs> just looking at the MRIs which she already had showed a thick inferior rectus muscle in that one orbit. I, I mean it fitted so well, but you know, when the neuroradiologist tells you normal scan, then then and if you don't look at it yourself, I mean you know that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah? Okay. <laughs> look at the scans yourself. Or talk to the to the neuroradiologist. That's yeah. what your point always says. The neuroophthalmologist is the interpreter of normal MRIs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and they are either normal because the disease doesn't show, that's like myasthenia or something like that, or they are normal because the neuroradiologist neuroradiologist just missed it, or they are normal because they are not imaging the right place. That's the three reasons. Well, if you want to hear more, you know, there is um, <coughs> Fogt, as I said, was not the nicest guy on earth. <laughs> I didn't meet him, of course, but he had a big fight with Hans Goldman. Does that ring a bell, Hans <laughs> Goldman? Good. So Hans Goldman was the chair, well, that was even before he was chair. He was in Bern. So he's the famous uh, guy in Bern, and they had a fight over what causes the... Um, cataract of people who work with glass, what's the glass name? Glass. Yes, yes, you know. Is it the heat or is it something else? And, and of course Goldman was right, you know, but, but <laughs> Fogg didn't, never for, forgive, forgave him yeah. for being right, anyway. <laughs> so, you know, this, uh, what else? Um, in Geneva, there, there was a famous um, chair by the name of Franceschetti, does that ring a bell? Genetics, lots of, and maybe the name you must know is uh, Lausanne. We have five universities in Zurich, Zurich, um, uh, sorry, in Switzerland, Zurich, Bern, Basel, uh, Lausanne, and Geneva. So Lausanne had, uh, the, the eye department is called Gonin, Jules Gonin Hospital, because Gonin was the one who, who was a retinal surgeon and who actually first discovered that you should that the hole in the retina is not um, the, the 
the consequence of the detachment, but the cause of the detachment. So you have to close the hole, and then the retina will lay in place. So that's quite, a, quite an amazing discovery. Yeah. And he had to fight a lot before this was accepted. Yeah. So I would like to thank Clara for coming uh, from S Switzerland to uh, give us this lecture. And we're going to be heading over to neurology now to talk about telemetry. So if you have the next hour to hear about uh, telemetry, it's going to be the PTT lecture. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.